The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Generally, if I tell a story that involves someone who is real from my life or my ministry in the past, I change the name, change some of the circumstances, so no one has to fear that, oh, when she gets to the next church, she's going to be telling stories about me. It's not quite like that. But I'm going to name her today. Her name was Rowena. Rowena came to my congregation when she was 78 years old. Her husband had died in New Jersey. She had no family left there, and she came to West Virginia to be close to her two granddaughters who were in college at the time. And Rowena asked me one Sunday, and she was a little, a little crazy girl. She asked me one Sunday, she said, is it okay if I stand up and address the congregation today? Knowing Rowena and some of the stories she told, I sort of wondered what it was going to be about. But she was so, so serious, so needing this moment. She wanted to give her testimony, and I said, certainly, feel free. And she stood up, and I will never forget how silent the room became when she said, my name is Rowena, and I am an alcoholic. 78 years old, an alcoholic. And she pulled from her pocket her coin and said, I just received my 40-year pin of sobriety. And went on to testify to the grace of God in Jesus Christ that found her when she was at the worst moment of her life and raised her up to something new and wonderful. Now, what's so amazing about this story is that she was new in town. No one knew her past. No one knew what she had been through. No one knew what a mess she had made of her life. She didn't have to tell anybody. She could have just gone on being the sweet little grandmother who was a little bit crazy sometimes. But instead, she wanted people to know who she was exactly and what defined her life. And every time I look at this story from Luke's Gospel in particular, I think of Rowena. Now, the story that was just read, the story that Jerry read, appears in all four Gospels. There's an anointing story of Jesus' feet, someone who anoints them with perfume or tears and dries them with her hair. This is not the same story that appears in the other Gospels. Now, we know that because in the other Gospels, she, Jesus goes to the home of a, of a leper named Simon. This time it's a Pharisee. In the other Gospels, the anointing happens near the time of his passion and his death, almost in preparation for his burial. And in John's Gospel in particular, the woman is named, and it's Mary, sister of Martha and Lazarus, who is anointing Jesus' feet and weeping over his feet in response to him calling her brother dead from his tomb back to life, the resuscitation of Lazarus, not the resurrection. He was brought back to this life, not to new and eternal life. But this is an unnamed woman. And the only thing we know about her is that she was a sinner. Now, think for a moment, what could that mean, she was a sinner? And I bet you're jumping to the same conclusions that everyone else does. Nowhere in scripture does it say that she was a prostitute, but we immediately go there, don't we? Especially with women and sin. But think back to the time when Jesus calls Peter, the fisherman, and Peter falls down before him after that miraculous catch and says, ah, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinner. We don't know what her sin was, but we know it was substantial and that it was made public and everyone knew who she was. Not only is she a sinner, she's uninvited to the party. Jesus was there, we think, at this time in his ministry because word about him had spread and he was sort of the guest of honor in a sense, sitting next to Simon, who was the host, Simon the Pharisee. And a woman shows up at the party who doesn't have an invitation, she doesn't have anything but she walks in, goes up behind Jesus. And you have to remember the way they ate in this time and in this culture. They would be reclining, sort of on a, a couch type thing, and his feet would have been sort of behind him. He would have been leaning on his left elbow and eating with his right. And suddenly someone behind him is wetting his feet, first with her tears, drying them with her hair, and then opens this alabaster jar of very expensive ointment and starts to bathe her feet. And Simon, and I'm sure most of the other people there, were scandalized by this gate crasher who had shown up at the party because they all knew who she was and what she had done. They knew what a mess she had made of her life. And Simon thinks to himself, well, Jesus may be a teacher, he may be a rabbi, but he's certainly no prophet. 
because if he had been a prophet, he would know who it was who was touching him, and he would have nothing to do with this woman. And Jesus knows his thoughts, and that's scary. Jesus knows our thoughts before we even have time to speak them. Perhaps it was the expression on Simon's face as he looked at her with great disdain. And Jesus says to him, Simon, I'm a guest in your home. You didn't provide water to wash my feet, which was not law, but tradition and a sign of hospitality. You offered me no kiss. She hasn't stopped kissing my feet since she's been here. And again, I need to say, that is not a sexual act here. There was nothing sexual. There was something very intimate in her response to him. But it wasn't a sexual act. She was doing what was done for great teachers and those for whom a great debt was owed. She was showing her devotion and her gratitude. And she anoints his feet. She's offering him perfume. And it was the tradition of the time, if you had an honored guest, that you would anoint their hair with oil when they came into your home. But Simon, being a Pharisee, was doing the letter of the law, nothing more. So what he had done was acceptable, but it did not show any sort of understanding of who Jesus was or who Jesus was going to be in the life of the Jewish community. He was sort of an anomaly, a little bit of an attraction, a little bit of a celebrity that brought other people to Simon's home. And then Jesus tells a parable within this story, which sums up the parable. He says to him, there was a person who owed a great debt, 50 denarii. And now a denarii is not a small amount of money. It's the, it's the standard day laborer's wage. So quick, do the math in your head. What would 50 times your salary be? Not an insignificant amount, 50 days pay. And that debt was forgiven him. That's what he owed and it was forgiven him. And there is another one there who owes 500, a year and a half of your salary. And that debt is forgiven. Which, Jesus asks Simon, would love him more? And Simon says, I suppose, I suppose, that it was the one who owed the greater debt. And Jesus says, she is the one who was forgiven the greater debt. Now we know that she's already been forgiven. This is not a story of her coming to Jesus looking for forgiveness. This is not a, this is not a confessional. This is the response from the depth of her soul and her heart for forgiving her sin. We know that from that very one little word, hence. Hence, she is offering all that she has. If you listen to our Ash Wednesday service, I talked about the difference between penance and penitence. Penance is self-inflicted punishment for sins, trying to atone. Penance is something that is you put upon yourself to do. But this isn't even penitence, which is different. Penitence is being sorrowful for your sins. Penitence is knowing in the depth of your soul that you've done wrong and turning toward God that leads to repentance. But this isn't penance or penitence. This is just pure gratitude because in some sense, Jesus had already forgiven her. We don't know what her sin was. We don't know the conversation that they probably had before this happened. We don't know perhaps if she is listening to his teaching and was so moved that she let go of her old grief and her old guilt and entered into new life there. But we know that whatever it was, it was pretty bad. It was bad enough that she would risk going into a room full of people who had nothing to do with her. She didn't care about what they thought of her because she was not defined by their bad understanding of who she was. She was not defined by their finger pointing and their judgment. She was defined by the grace of God made real for her in Jesus Christ. That's what this story is about. It's about the difference between humiliation and humility. Humility is something that comes from us. It's not counting ourselves to be better than others. It's understanding who we are, and especially in light of God's love. Compared to Jesus, who is without sin, we are really in a mess. That's what humility is, understanding who we are, not thinking better of ourselves than we should. On the other hand, humiliation, which comes from the same root, which is being brought low, is what is done to us by others who cannot accept the grace that has been shown to us. And unfortunately, that's how the people of God and Jesus Christ can be sometimes, can it? I told you the story of Rowena. Let me tell you a story of a man. I'm going to call him John because I'm going to change his story a little bit. 
he wrote me a letter and said, you can't tell anybody about this. But Sunday, I reached my 20th anniversary of sobriety, and I so wanted to stand up in the congregation and share what God had done for me. But I was afraid because I knew people would never look at me the same way again, and they would think worse of me for that. I'm not saying that compared to Rowena, he was someone who lacked faith, because this letter came in response to something that happened in the greater community in another congregation, where a man's sins were made public and published in the newspaper, and the members of the congregation went to the pastor and said, tell him to leave or everyone here is going to go. We will not worship with someone like him. To that pastor's credit, he said, if he goes, I go with him. And lots of members of the congregation left, but some stayed and the church continued to grow and to thrive. There's so much in this story for us, isn't there? Will we allow ourselves like this woman to be defined by grace? Or will we be defined by other people's bad opinion of us? Will we be defined by their judgment and their finger pointing? Will we be defined by our worst mistake? Or will we be lifted up by Christ who makes all things new, including us? Or will we be like Simon and the others who know they've never done anything that bad, who find in comparing themselves to others sort of this whew, at least I'm not like that. At least I've never killed anyone. I've never cheated on my wife. I've never stolen. I've never, I've never, I've never, I've never. Instead of looking at our own sinfulness and understanding that the debt that has been forgiven us may not be as big as the debt forgiven someone else, but compared to Christ, it's huge. Because we're called to let him be the standard bearer not to compare ourselves with others. I've said this so many times, and I'll continue to say it probably until I retire from ministry. God does not grade on the curve. The final judgment is not like we're standing there with others. It's not a lineup. Because I tell you what, if I go in there and I'm standing between Adolf Hitler, Joseph Mengele, Pol Pot, I'm going to look pretty good. Knowing my luck, I'm going to go in there, and there's Dr. King, and there's Billy Graham, there's Mother Teresa, and then I don't look so good, do I? because we are not called to compare ourselves with others, favorably or unfavorably. We are called to go to God, not on our righteousness, not saying, look at all the good I've done, Lord, but to go on our knees saying, but for your grace, I would not be saved. It's all about grace and it's all about gratitude. It's all about accepting forgiveness. So many people have trouble with accepting forgiveness. So many people have said to me, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. No, if God forgives you, you're forgiven, you're made clean, you're made new, you're made whole, and your life starts anew from that point. It doesn't mean you'll remain sinless. It doesn't mean you won't make mistakes. But if you continue to lay your sins at the foot of the cross and then pick them up again and wear them in penance or just in guilt, you'll never know the freedom that God in Christ brings to you. I hope that we can get to the point where we don't let other people define us, we don't let our sin define us, that we let grace define us. And I hope that like the woman in the story and like my girl Rowena, you will stand up and you will say, this is who I was, but this is who I am now. Not through my own merit, not through my own hard work, not through my own prayer even, but through the power of God and Jesus Christ working in my life because I've given my life to him and he has made it something beautiful. He has made it something whole. He has made it something worthy because even if you're uninvited, Christ welcomes you to the banquet because he is the host and we are his grateful guests. But it calls forth response. It calls forth a life committed to transforming into the person that Christ calls you to be it calls letting go of the past and moving forward in his name, and it calls for gratitude from the depth of your soul so that you might, like this woman, not care who looks at you, who sees you, what they think of you, but you will go to Christ with your offering of thanksgiving and your offering of peace. The definition of humility is a modest opinion of one's own importance. The definition of humiliation is to cause a painful loss of pride, self-respect, or dignity. 
May we go to Christ in humility and welcome others and never look at them pointing the finger of humiliation and judgment so that together we might move forward in Christ, who is our Savior, so that together we might offer him all that we have and all that we are in response to his great love, his mercy, and his peace. I don't know the size of your debt, but I know the size of my own. I'm not getting there on my own, folks. I need a Savior. Thanks be to God. In Jesus Christ, I have a Savior. You have a Savior. We have a Savior. Go to him, open your heart, and pour out your praise to the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.